Next question. Accepting that the plural of anecdote isn't data, what role can or may anecdotes play, if any, in analysis? Particularly repeated and or highly translatable anecdotes or analyzing qualitative rather than quantitative circumstances. I wanted to pull something up, actually. If you want to riff from it, I want to pull yeah, something up. Sure. I'll um, riff. Um, the, the sense of the danger of anecdotes is way overdrawn. And in some sense, it is designed by the same people who are constantly wielding, you know, the data is king, what do the data say, um, data-driven research, these sorts of things, which sound right, you know. It sounds sophisticated to be skeptical of anecdotes. And it is. it sounds very sophisticated to say that the multiple uh, of anecdote is not data. On the other hand, first of all, in a complex system, when you do observation, you are observing anecdotes. That's how you get to a hypothesis that's worthy of test. And so um, let's just say if anecdote exists in the observational phase of scientific research, it's perfectly legitimate and um, it just simply travels by a different name. Uh, so in any case, there are certain things that are deployed to keep a powerful group powerful, and this is one of them. So I would yeah. say... Um, uh, correlation implies causation when it's preceded by a properly predictive hypothesis, despite what you've been told. Um, and uh, anecdote is a very important source of information about a system. It is not in and of itself a test of a hypothesis. Yep. Um, though it can be used as a spot check, right? You can have a hypothesis for some reason and then you can check it against the anecdotes in your head and say, actually, I don't believe that hypothesis because I know six instances in which they would have gone a different way, each of which were anecdotes. You can falsify with anecdote. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, what I wanted to say, I can't find the actual uh, paper, but there's um, a reading that I used to give um, from Barbara Smuts, who's, um, who was on my doctoral committee, and one of the important researchers in um, baboon behavior and specifically um, who focused on uh, female baboon behavior. Uh, and in her book, Sex and Friendship in Baboons, she wrote a bit about um, basically the the kinds of data that you take in the field. And so I just went looking into my methodology, behavioral methodology lectures that I would give to students before I sent them out to try to start to become animal behaviorists. And I, I don't find it there, but um, there, she has a sort of a, a taxonomy of of course, the kind of thing that you can see over and over again between individuals and also keep track of the context in which you saw them are the things that we look for when we are going to um, apply statistical analysis to the data. Um, but there are two other categories of things, and I don't, I just don't have it in my head and I can't pull it up here, um, some of which happen occasionally but under such dissimilar circumstances that you couldn't, that even though you might have 10 instances, you still can't apply statistics to them because you know that they're the same but they're not the same enough. And then some of which you may actually just see once or twice. And so there is no expectation that you would actually um, be able to apply statistics. And therefore, you know, you can, and, and if you can't apply statistics, we basically don't call it data, except that, and, you know, if it's only one off or two off thing, we tend to call it anecdote. But over in um, trying to understand behavior land, over in animal behavior land, the rarest things are often the most explanatory and certainly the most exciting. So, you know, we know that chimps sometimes wage war on one another because Jane Goodall saw it happen once over an extended period of days. But it's one, I think it was a I think it was a fissioning group um, that then drew a line in the sand, effectively, and fighted with one another. Uh, fighted. Fighted. Hmm. <laughs> and then and, and fought with one another. Um, and similarly, you will find, um, you know, just other kinds of territorial takeovers or sexual takeovers or um, you know, either the bunch between groups or the replacement of an alpha or um, or defense um, by females, by usurping male against infanticide. You know, these sorts of things happen rarely enough that you may not have enough for data. But once you see it, if you're out there trying to understand animals, um, you then have a very different model of what it is that's happening and what's driving them. It's, it's the rare event that often is explanatory. And no, we can't plug it into stats, but um, it will be the thing that informs our understanding maybe more than, and today they've foraged again. Of course and they did, right? Once upon a time, back before we became so stupid, we used to know this. 
right? Used You're not to talking be, about us. No, we, so we, we, we are trying to opt out of stupid. It's sometimes a full-time job, but, um, <laughs> but you know, it used to be that natural history yes. was understood to be a scientifically valid pursuit and in fact, yes. a very important one. And the fact is the, you know, the uh, uh, data-driven science people have, among other things, they've driven out theory and they've driven out um, natural history. Mm -hmm. So used to be you saw something remarkable like I once saw what I believe to be a woodpecker riding on the back of a crow. What? It was amazing. Where? Uh, in a deep lake in uh, in, in Sun Lakes in Eastern Washington. Um, but in any case, well, right? I don't think, I don't think I you also, told me this. <laughs> I also saw a moose there, right? Yeah, a they're, moose they're in there. in the desert, right? So here's the thing: there used to be a thing called a natural history note, where you saw something. It was unmistakable what mm -hmm. you saw, and you documented as much about what it was that you saw, and then you just simply reported it so mm -hmm. that everybody would have the benefit of effectively having seen the same thing. Well, actually, I published one of these. I published one of these um, with regard to, let's see, I could have done two. Which one did I publish? Ah, um, with regard to my frogs in Madagascar. At one point, I'm sitting there watching this marked population of, of I've tattooed them so I know who all the individuals are. And I've got a couple of fights going on. I mean, they're very active, fascinating little, little poisonous frogs. Um, and up from the leaf litter comes a boa, and uh, grabs one of the female frogs. I knew I knew the frogs. So I knew this is a female. And uh, all all the talking in the landscape stops. All the males stop talking, and they all kind of everyone kind of slinks off. And this boa kind of chews on the frog for 10, 15 minutes, spits it out. This frog then goes on to become a mother because I'm tracking her. She's tattooed. I know. I, I see her engage in courtship and lay an egg and feeds her tadpoles. And she 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 ends up fine. And this boa is no longer um, around after that day. Learned its lesson. But that's one time. Yeah. Right? That's one time. I've got one anecdote. It's fascinating. But it is actually a natural history note in, I don't know, Herpetologica, Journal of Herpetology, something. Yep. Um, so these things do still exist, but they're rarer and rarer. They're rarer and they're not looked at with the same kind of reverence that um, a database yeah. paper is. But from yeah. the point of view of actually understanding nature, man, give me a natural historian who knows what they're doing any day, right? Yeah. These these people have understood something deep and... Um, uh, it's Dan Jansen, the famous tropical biologist, who once said, um, a biologist dies with 90% of what he knows, mm -hmm. right? Takes it to the grave. Um, and this is unfortunate because in some sense, what a biologist accumulates over, or a naturalist accumulates over a lifetime of watching creatures is really very valuable stuff. And it's just impossible to record all of the things that you've come to understand by yeah. all of the anecdotes you've encountered. Absolutely. I mean, it's actually part of probably a small part, but part of why you and I find this situation that's going on outside right now so troubling, that um, we both uh, create sense of our world by going out into it and reflecting on the changing of the seasons and the plants and the birds and, and you know everything that's happening just in our immediate vicinity. And being really unable to spend more than a few minutes outside, even while masked. You know, we don't have any N95 masks, but even while masked without feeling, you know, quite at risk at the moment, uh, puts us at such a remove from an ability to interact with anything that isn't us or what we've created right here is uh, incredibly restricting. Yeah, it is. It's turned us, it's turned our world into a, an all social one, which is something we seek to avoid most of the time. Not yeah. that we avoid all social stuff, but we avoid because it we being don't like each other very much. <laughs> no, we avoid <laughs> the complete socialness of, of yes. the world, and um, anyway, it's been enforced by smoke. Yeah. 